Greetings and thank you so much for joining us today on the online service. You know, it's uh, a joy to be able to uh, minister the Word of God to you uh, this way, even though it is kind of distant because we don't get to see each other physically and shake hands or, you know, actually have conversation. Uh, but thank God that at least we are able to come your way uh, through this medium and share the Word of God and pray with you. I just want to welcome, I welcome all of you. Uh, we want to especially welcome those who might be joining us for the very first time. If you are a visitor, quote unquote, visitor to our online service, a first time visitor, we want to especially welcome you. We just want to, you know, if you'd like to, uh, if you can uh, visit our church website, which is apcwo.org, uh, you can visit our website. And there on the far right corner, there's a little mail icon. You can click on it and uh, write your, put in your email address and subscribe to our newsletter, our weekly emailer, rather, uh, that sends an email out. We send an email out letting people know about the sermon that was preached on Sunday, uh, as well as other events and things that happened. So if you'd like to do that, it's a way for you to connect with us. We'll get to know that you were there and also keep you informed of things that are happening. There are other ways, of course, that you can reach out to us. Our member care, what we call us a member care uh, email, and our phone numbers are available. You can email us, call us, uh, and reach out to us, and we'd be happy to assist you as we can. I want to just uh, uh, point you to free resources on our church website. There are a number of resources available that you could make use of, especially during uh, this season. Now, we've got quite a few emails. It's very interesting that during this period, we've got quite a few emails uh, where people have written telling us that they have been listening to these old sermons. Some of these sermon series were preached, you know, several years ago, uh, but because they're all available on our website, they go back, they're able to listen to it, and they tell us that uh, the emails that have come recently, telling us that those sermons preached there as they went through those series uh, really impacted them today. And, and that's so encouraging uh, that, uh, you know, people who are not around, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, when those messages were preached, they get to hear them today, and those sermons are impacting their lives uh, powerfully even today. So I encourage you to make use of those sermons. And we are encouraged uh, by those emails that come in telling us how these uh, resources are being uh, uh, being used as a blessing to people. Uh, I just want to remind you that today is, as being the first Sunday of the month, we will partake of the Lord's table, Holy Communion, uh, at the end of this service. So uh, if you have not yet done so, we encourage you to just get some bread and juice, or if you don't have juice, or you can bring some water or something, uh, so that we can partake of uh, the Lord's table together. Uh, I know it's difficult sometimes to go and find grape juice these days, but uh, if you don't have it, uh, use water, that's fine. So we just get that together, keep it ready, and we're going to partake of it at the end of the service after we uh, spend some time in the Word of God and in prayer together. Before we proceed further, we're going to do our declaration together, and then we will get into the Word of God and also pray together and partake of the Lord's table. Good morning, church family. We're just so glad that you could join us this morning for our online service. A special welcome to those of you who have tuned in for the very first time. I hope you find our service a blessing to you. Uh, please feel free to subscribe and like and share our links with your friends and family. Uh, before we get to uh, our declaration, I just want to share a short word of encouragement. Uh, that's from Numbers chapter 6, verse 22 to 27. Uh, it's from Numbers chapter 6 verses 22 to 27. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And verse 27, it says, So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. You know, we see here God telling Moses to instruct Aaron and his sons. This was an instruction given by God to the high priests of the old covenant to release blessing over the children of Israel, which was God's people. This is a mandate uh, given by God where people would have to release his word and release his blessing to his children. 
you know, and what's so amazing is we, as people of the new covenant, as high priests through Christ Jesus, have the authority given by Jesus to speak uh, over our own lives and over our own families as well. Speak words of blessing. In fact, Jesus in the, old, uh, in the new covenant said, speak to your mountain without doubt and it will be moved. So I just wanted to bring this short encouragement for us to release God's word over our own lives and over our families. So I just want us to invite us this time to make our declaration together. So, you know, the words will come up on the screen. Uh, let's declare this loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I am saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I am a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word. I believe his word and I live by his word. Christ is my master and to him I am in absolute surrender. I present myself as a new wineskin to receive the new wine and fresh oil being poured out on me. God releases new things and a new work of his spirit in me and through me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you for leading us in the declaration. Today, I want to bring a very simple message, and uh, yet it is a very, very important message for all of us. Most of what I'm going to say in today's message is, is not new. It's things uh, many of us may have heard in the past, and that even I personally have spoken uh, many times in the past. But you know, it's good for us just to be reminded about things that uh, are in the Word of God. It's just good to be reminded over and over again, uh, just to rekindle afresh uh, some of the things that uh, you know, we may have taken for granted, and, uh, but the, the fire of those things seem to be diminishing, and it's good to just add some fuel to the fire and just rekindle it. So this morning, I'm going to talk to us about knowing God intimately, knowing God intimately. You know, we all have a desire to know God. All of us as believers, we want to grow in our knowledge of the Lord. How can I get to know God more? And uh, that is, uh, I, I believe, the cry of everyone's heart. We want to know Him more. And uh, of course, there are many, many uh, blessings, if you want to call it that, or the good things that come out of knowing God, we are changed, uh, we become more like Him, we are transformed, and so on. Uh, and so I just want to mention just two things about uh, the outcomes, the fruits, or uh, uh, the benefits of uh, knowing God, but then I want to focus in on the how. What must I do in order to know God? I just want to highlight a few things that will encourage us and maybe stir us up uh, to pursue God even more intently. Now, just to remind us you know, of two benefits of growing in our knowledge of God, or growing in intimacy with God, getting to know Him more and more personally. We're not talking about knowing about God, about head knowledge. You know, sometimes people know the Hebrew and the Greek, and they, uh, they can argue about words and meanings and all of that, but they don't know the God who, God of the Bible. They may know, the, you know, a lot about the Bible, but they don't know the God of the Bible. And so our goal is really through the study of the Word and through our time with God to know the God of the Bible, to know Him as a person, uh, to have a close relationship with the person. Uh, and that's what we are pursuing or going after. What, will be, what, are some of the two, what are some of the benefits? And I just mentioned two. First of all, knowing God intimately is a source of our strength. Uh, Daniel 11, verse 32. We know these scriptures. It says, you know, uh, the latter part of that verse, it says, the people who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. The people who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. Actually, when you're looking at the context of Daniel 11, uh, it's really they're talking about what uh, 
uh, that the, the evil person will do to the people of God. But while the evil person or the Antichrist uh, is, 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 is really uh, bringing about uh, his weight to upon the people of God, uh, coming against them, it says in the middle of all that, verse 32, but there are going to be people who will know their God and they will do great exploits. So that's the context there. But the truth is this, that when we know our God, we are strengthened to carry out great exploits. You know, the people who knew their God were so empowered through their intimacy with God that they could do great exploits on the earth. And there are just amazing stories, testimonies, real life people who started with such insignificant backgrounds, insignificant upbringings, who made such a mark on history that we would wonder how did they do it? How could a shoemaker, a cobbler from England have such an impact on a nation like India that he would come here? Uh, he would spend 40 years of his life, he would learn I think like 16 languages, he would found a university, he would translate the scriptures in so many languages and, and leave a lasting legacy that he would then be called the father of modern missions. But he had such a humble beginning. How could a man do that? Well, the people who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. Simple people, ordinary people, People with no great name or fame or backing, but they had one thing in their lives. They knew their God. They were people who were so intimate with God. Their lives were so powerful. No force of man, no force of hell could stop great exploits from taking place through their lives. And that's what we must understand. You know, we all long to do something of significance for God, something of significance for his kingdom. But this is the secret. The people who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. Fruitfulness comes from knowing God, uh, from knowing him intimately. Jesus put it in John 15, verse 5. He said, you know, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. You'll bear much fruit. But he also said, without me, you can do nothing. So this fruitfulness in ministry comes from knowing God from that place of intimacy. You know, many of us forget that. We forget the importance of that place of intimacy with God, of us abiding in Him and Him abiding in us, and that giving rise to fruitfulness. You know, many of us, we wonder, like, what is the secret to fruitfulness in the Christian life? Uh, what will cause me to be fruitful? You know, Jesus made it so plain here. Sometimes we overlook it. You know, sometimes it's the simple things that actually have tremendous results, but it is also the simple things that we tend to overlook. We tend, we are looking for something very sophisticated, something very complicated. But actually, the secret to fruitfulness is very simple. He says, you abide in me, I abide in you. You abide in me, my words abide in you, and you will bear much fruit. So it's from that place of intimacy that fruitfulness flows. Uh, for many of us, uh, that is a little difficult to embrace because we want an equation. We want a formula. We want, tell me to do these 10 things and that will cause fruitfulness to come. But he's just saying, you come into this place of intimacy with me and I'll take care of fruitfulness. So while we of course do need uh, you know, to do our work and our part, but this is the place where fruitfulness is birthed, in that place of abiding in him. So doing great exploits and fruitfulness comes from that place of intimacy. So the question we want to answer today as we just spend some time in the word of God is, you know, how can I grow in my knowledge of God or knowing him as a person? I'm not talking about Bible knowledge. I'm talking about knowing God as a person. How can we grow in knowing him intimately, the person, not about him? You know, uh, the problem with the information overload today in our world is that there, are, there is so much information out there. You know, you, you know it's, it's endless. It's 
you know, so many new Christian books, so many new Christian preachers, so many new uh, videos to listen to, uh, so many new sermons. Uh, this is just, it's an overload. Uh, none of us can digest all of it. And sometimes in our, our, in our time being consumed by the latest books or the latest what so-and-so preached or what so-and-so said, we actually are losing out on a personal place of intimacy with God. So I want to call you back to simplicity. I want, you, I want to call you back to simply coming to this place of saying, God, I want to be more intimate with you, the person, not about you know, knowing the names of the latest preachers or the latest messages or the latest books. That doesn't necessarily always translate into personal intimacy with God. So I want to invite you back to you knowing God personally. How does it happen? What must, what, what, what must we do? What can we do according to the scriptures? Well, to begin with, we must understand what God told us in Jeremiah 29, verse 13. And I'm going to go through some very familiar scriptures just to remind us. In Jeremiah 29, 13, he said, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. A very simple statement. You seek me, you will find me. You seek me, you will find me. Think about it. You seek me, you will find me. So in order to find God, you have to seek him. It is not that God is lost. That's not the point. We're not playing hide and seek with God. But what he's saying is, if you come after me, you will encounter me. And he says, but you've got to do it with all your heart. Do it with all your heart. You will find me if you search for me with all your heart. So, very simple. To know him, we must pursue him. To know him, we must pursue him. You must go after him. After God. Say, so, Father, I want to know you more. I want to know your heart. I want to know who you are. I want to know your ways. I want to know your wisdom. I want to know you, God. So we must pursue him. So when you get up to pray, don't go, with, go to God with your prayer list. I mean, that, that has its place. I'm not saying disregard it. But our primary pursuit in prayer, our primary pursuit in the reading of the scriptures, our primary pursuit in listening to a message must be, I want to know him. Not, I want more information to argue with people about or fight about. No, no, no. I want to know him. So if to know him, we must pursue him. So the question to ask is, in all my Christian activity that I'm engaged in, whether it's prayer, whether it's Bible reading, all of that, uh, what am I pursuing? Am I pursuing more information? Am I pursuing, uh, you know, um, just... Uh, 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 you know, uh, the ability to say, I've heard the latest sermon or the latest message, or am I really pursuing the Lord himself? To know him, we have to pursue him. And what I want to do is highlight, remind us of some ways in which we pursue God. How am I supposed to pursue God? Just reminders. Number one, we must pursue him passionately. We must pursue him passionately. Now, when I use the word passionately, it means with zeal, with enthusiasm, with some excitement, uh, with some emotion. You know, think about children. And many of us uh, had our favorite sport. You know, uh, maybe you enjoyed cricket, maybe you enjoyed soccer, or maybe you enjoyed some other sport. But think about, you know, when we were children, or children, you can think about. You know, they can never get enough of playing their favorite sport. They may have just spent two hours playing soccer, and they come back home for some refreshment or rest, and somebody says, let's go play soccer. They bounce up, run out, and play. You know, again, it's the same sport, but they are as excited about playing it again. What is it? They are passionate. There is passion involved. There's a sense of enthusiasm. Uh, they, they love it. They're enjoying it. And we must learn to pursue God Passionately, Psalm 63, uh, verse 1 to 3, the psalmist said, O Lord, 
You are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. He says, my soul and my flesh, they are longing for you. In other words, you know, he's not really talking about his heart posture. But he's talking about the very fact that his soul and his body, I mean, he's desiring God with all of his being. There's a passion involved. As the deer pants for the water brook, so longs my soul uh, for you, O God. So there is that longing, there's passion. So to know God intimately, we must pursue him passionately, with passion, with excitement. So for some of us, reading the Bible can be such a big problem. It's more difficult than doing the dishes. It's more difficult than cleaning the house. It's like, oh man, I got to read my Bible. But you know what? Ask God to change that. Ask God to ignite a passion in you for him. Later on, towards the end of the sermon, I'm going to just bring our attention to the fact that it is God who gives us the grace to pursue him. So some of you may say, look, you know, you're talking about pursuing God passionately. For me, I find that very difficult. I mean, passion for God is the last thing. I'm passionate about ice cream. I'm passionate about biryani. I'm passionate about, you know, whatever else. But passionate about God, that's probably the last thing. It's somewhere way down low in my list of things. I'm not so excited about God. Well, today, we're going to pray and ask God to instill in you, in me, a passion that our whole being will be excited to spend time in the Word, to pray. It's not an obligation we fulfill. It's not a duty we perform, but it's a passion that grips us. And that's why we pursue God. We, to know Him intimately, we pursue Him passionately. Secondly, you know, to, uh, to, we must pursue Him intently. Intently. Intent means with focus, with a single-minded devotion. Focus him intently. There is a focus on God. So for, for you and me, to know him intimately, uh, to know him intimately, we must pursue him intently. The psalmist put it like this, and we are familiar with this in Psalm 24, verse, Psalm 27, verse 4. He said, one thing. I have desired of the Lord one thing I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He says, you know, there's one thing that I'm focused on. That's being intent. That's being focused. What do I want? I want to see the beauty. I want to just gaze upon the beauty. I'm enraptured with who he is. So, how was he pursuing God very intently? Focused on God. And he says, that's what I'll desire to do, to focus on God. So focus on God, to pursue him intently with focus. Focus shifts or determines our priorities. So when you're focused on God, then that becomes your priority. I'm not saying, you know, we neglect other areas. You know, we have other responsibilities. We all have to go to work. Uh, we all have to put in those hours of work. We all have our responsibilities to fulfill. So I'm not saying neglect those things. But because you're so focused or intent on pursuing God, that becomes your priority. And of course, you make time to fulfill your other obligations, your responsibilities. But priority shifts. That becomes important priority. You make it your top priority. Focus also means we avoid distractions. When you're focused on something, you're able to say no to things that would distract you or want to take away your time. You begin to focus. It avoids distractions. You're gripped by what you focus. Focus also strengthens consistency. How can you be consistent in this? Because of focus. If you're focused on something, you'll be consistent in it. If you are, you know, shifting your focus, shifting focus causes distractions, accommod accommodating distractions. So the key to consistency is to focus. To know him intimately, we must pursue him intently. Number three, we must pursue him 
earnestly. Earnestly means with sincerity. You're pursuing him because he is your desire. You're not pursuing him saying, God, I will give you one hour so that you will do this and this for me. Now that's bargaining with God. That is not pursuing him earnestly. Now, of course we know there are going to be benefits of intimacy with God. We know that God, if we are with him in the secret place, he will reward us out there in public. That's he, is something he already promised. And, and we know all that. We know that spending time with him will strengthen us. Spending time with him will make us fruitful. We know all those benefits. But we need to come to that place where we say, God, I want to seek you because of you. You are my reward. The fact that I'm going to get to know you more is reward enough for me, and I don't care about the other things, whether they happen or not. Of, of course they're going to happen because God already said it's going to happen. You are going to be fruitful. You will do great exploits. Uh, God will reward you uh, publicly. All that will happen. But that, those things are not what is going to motivate you. You are motivated by the fact that I just want more of God. That's being earnest. That's being in a place of sincerity or wanting to know God for who he is. Jesus said, you know, in John 4, 23, 24, we know the scripture. He says, you know, uh, uh, people are going to worship God in spirit and in truth. For the Father is looking for such people who worship him. That's a spirit out of their heart, in truth, out of sincerity, out of purity of heart. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 25 and verse 8, he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You see, our revelation of God is determined by the posture of our heart, by the purity of our heart, the sincerity of our heart. When our heart is pure, our revelation is clearer. You can see God better. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. So we come with a pure heart, with sincere hearts, saying, God, I really want to know you for who you are. We pursue God sacrificially. So when you and I want to pursue God, it's going to cost us something. Sometimes you may have to say, no uh, to some time that you could have spent uh, in other ways, in recreation or uh, just doing something. I'm not saying recreation is wrong or uh, watching, uh, you know, uh, uh, watching a sport or a movie or something. Those things are wrong. I'm not saying that. But sometimes you sacrifice those things in order to pursue him. You pursue him sacrificially. You know, in Matthew 14, verses 22 to 23, was a classic example. You know, Jesus had just finished a great time of ministry. Uh, he, and, and the next thing we see him do is he sends his disciples away in a boat. And then he goes, uh, he sends the crowds away. And then he goes away in the mountain to pray. You know, he could have basked in the glory of all that had happened. All the crowds around him. He could have hung up there, you know, and just chatted away and listened to, you know, them telling him how great he was or whatever. He could have done that. But no, it says he sent the multitudes away and he went out to be alone with the Father. So Jesus was very intent and he made space. He made time to be alone with the Father. And for us in our lives, it it. It, it calls for sacrifice because there are so many things that will want to consume our time. But we make space. We push things aside and says, I'm sacrificing this time because I want to be with the Father. When was the last time you sacrificed in order to spend time with the Father? In order to come into that place of intimacy, you made that time. So in order to pursue God, we have to pursue him with sacrifice. To know him intimately, we must pursue him sacrificially. Just a few more here. We must pursue him wholeheartedly. That means with everything we've got, we have to pursue him wholeheartedly. With all that is in you. Jesus put it like this. You know, when you love, you must love the Lord your God. Mark 12, 28 to 30, he said, love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. How do I love him? All your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That means all of you is in it. You're in this hands, feet, soul, body, everything, in it wholeheartedly. So when you pursue, and you and I pursue God, all of us, everything about us is laid there in order to pursue Him. You, you pursue Him with everything you have. You know, sometimes we are half-hearted in this whole thing. It's like Sunday morning, when you have to go 
you know, attend church, and of course, nowadays we do it online, but, you know, you go and go, well, I have to do it because if I don't do it, maybe pastor will call me on Tuesday. Or somebody from church will call me and say, where, where were you? We didn't see you. So you're going there not because you want to pursue God. Uh, that, that is kind of secondary. The primary is, I, I don't want to get that call. Or I don't want somebody to ask me, well, what happened? It, that is a half-hearted engaging with God. And you don't, want, you don't want that. God says, I want your whole, you know, you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Give me all. I want that. And so... We need to come to that place of pursuing God. To know Him intimately, we must pursue Him wholeheartedly. Another important thing about pursuing God is we pursue Him humbly. That means we come with awe and reverence before God. You know, we know that what God has done for us in Christ, we know that we are heirs of God, we're joint heirs with Jesus, uh, we know that God has clothed us with His righteousness, and we know all those wonderful things that enable us to come with boldness and confidence, but yet we are so much in awe of God that we come humbly, we come in adoration, we come uh, knowing how great God is and that we are His creation and He is our Creator. We come humbly. Now, why is humility so important? Because the Scriptures teach us in James 4, 6 that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Now, when we come with pride or with arrogance, it distances us from God. But when we come humbly before God, it draws God in to that place of intimacy with Him. The last one is this, that when we pursue him, we must pursue him with expect expectantly. That means we must pursue him knowing he will engage with us. This is not a one-sided effort that I am trying to know him and he is not interested in knowing me. It's not a one-sided thing. We pursue him knowing that he will come to us. In Hosea chapter 6 and verse 3, it says, Let us pursue the knowledge of God, knowing that he will come to us like the rain. So you pursue God, and you know He will come to you like the rain. And the Bible tells us in James 4 and verse 8, it says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. So we know that as we pursue Him with expectation, He will come to us. So when you go into a time of prayer, when you go into a time of reading the Word, you go with expectation, I'm going to encounter God. I might read five verses, but I'm expecting God to speak to me. I'm expecting God to come and whisper into my heart that expectation. I'm expecting God to reveal something out of his word to me today. So that's expectation. So when we pursue him, we pursue him with expectation. So here's the thing I want us to understand. You make the first move and God will meet you when you do that. See, many of us say, you know, I just want God to come to me and reveal himself to me. But actually, God is saying, you make the first move, I'll meet you. A good illustration of this is seen in the Old Testament, where God, when, when the people of God brought their sacrifice, God put the fire on it. That was a sign of saying, you've made your move, here's my seal of approval. So when we make our move of pursuing Him, He releases Himself to us. We provide the sacrifice, He provides the fire. The grace to pursue Him is given to us by God Himself. God empowers us by His grace to pursue Him in this manner. And so what we want to do today is to ask God for the grace to pursue Him intimately. I'm going to review the things that I shared with us, and then we're going to pray and say, God, you give me the grace to do this. So. We mentioned seven ways to pursue God. Pursue Him passionately. Pursue Him with passion. Pursue Him intently, that means with focus. Keep your focus on the Lord. Don't get distracted by other things. Pursue Him earnestly, that means with sincerity. God, I'm sincere about this. I want you, just you. I know there are blessings, but I want you more than the blessings. There's nothing wrong with the blessings. It'll come. But my desire is for you. Pursue him sacrificially. Make some sacrifice. Maybe it's the way you use your time and so on. Sacrifice. God sees that. Pursue him wholeheartedly. Everything laid out there before the Lord. Pursue him humbly. Standing in awe 
how great he is. There is no arrogance and no pride in me approaching God, saying, God, you know, I'm this great preacher, so you've got to come and meet me. No, 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 no. God, you are creator. I am creation. You are the shepherd. I'm the sheep of your pasture. You are father. I'm your son. I come humbly before you. Pursue him with expectation. That God, I know, when I pursue you, you will come to me. Because you said, search me, you will find me. If you search for me, with all your heart. So that's what we want to do. I want to encourage you to grow in your intimacy with God. Desire to know him more. And one of the greatest signs that you are be knowing him more is when you become more like him. When you become more like him, that is a clear indication you are growing in the knowledge of the Lord. Why? Because you cannot know him without being transformed into his image. You cannot gaze upon him without his beauty reflecting off of your life. So the clearest indication that you are growing in your intimacy with God is you being transformed into his image. When people see Jesus in you, it's because you have been with Jesus. When people can see Christ in you, it's because you are growing in your intimacy with Jesus Christ. So that is a, is a clearest indicator of your growth in intimacy with the Lord. You becoming like him. What we're going to do today is we're going to take a few moments to pray and say, God, give me the grace to pursue you. Give me the grace to do what I can to grow in knowing you. I want to pray that. Then we're going to have the worship team come, lead us in a time of worship, and then after that, we're going to come back and then partake of the Lord's table together. So uh, if you need to go and get, your, get things ready during that time, you can get things ready, prepare your heart, and we will come back after worship and partake of the Lord's table together. But now, let's pray. Pray that God will help you and me, help us pursue Him so that we can know Him. Let's pray together. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you will empower each one of us. Give us the grace to pursue you. Father, I pray that there will be a change in the way we pursue you. That there will be a change in how we are coming after you. That right now and today you will ignite such a fire in our hearts that our desire will be for you and more of you. God, that we will refocus, realign ourselves to pursuing you, to seeking for more of you, Father, of getting to meet with you through your word, of getting to meet with you in prayer, in worship. Do that in us. Help us, Lord, even as we heard today, to pursue you passionately, intently, earnestly, sacrificially, wholeheartedly, humbly, and expectantly, God. Help us to pursue you. Father, I pray that each one of us will be people who know our God. It will be said of us, these people, know their God. And their lives are fruitful. Their lives are powerful because they know their God. I pray that your fire will fall, stirring up in each of us a passion for you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the secret the quiet thing in the stillness you are there in the 
We're going to partake of the Lord's table together. I just want you to uh, uh, join me in prayer. We're going to just pray with the elements. Uh, if you are the head of the household there and your family is with you, I just want you to lay uh, your hands on the elements, the bread and the grape juice or water that you have. We're going to pray with them, and then we're going to partake of the Lord's table. Now, the Lord's table is very important because it represents to us everything that Jesus died to give us on the cross. Uh, it talks about his body that was crucified for us. It talks about his blood that was shed for us. And as we partake, you know, we are using earthly tokens. Bread. What is bread? It's simple. There's nothing special about it. It's just ordinary bread. Juice, grape juice. But they are representing something. They are representing something very powerful. They are representing what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And you and I, by faith, receive for ourselves what Jesus provided for us on the cross. On the cross, he shed his blood so that our sins could be forgiven. He took upon himself our sickness, our diseases, so that the Bible says, by his stripes we were healed. He became a curse for us so that the the curse of the Lord could be removed and the blessing of Abraham can come upon us. On the cross, he destroyed demonic powers. Satan has already been judged, condemned, uh, destroyed. There's no more arguments here. I don't know how to defend a case against Satan. He's already been judged. I only treat him as a defeated enemy. He's under my feet. He's under your feet. It's done. So today... As we partake of these elements, 
we say, God, thank you for what has been done. I'm receiving it by faith. I'm commanding my body to be healed. I'm commanding uh, sickness to leave. I'm commanding chains to be broken. I'm commanding every work of the enemy to lie underneath my feet because of the cross of Jesus. So as we pray and partake, I want you to expect the power of the cross to be administered into your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's do that. Let's pray and partake together. Father, in Jesus' name, with all those joining us in their homes, we consecrate these simple elements, Lord, of bread and juice, grape juice, or water. We consecrate these simple elements that represent to us what Jesus did on the cross. And Father, even as we partake of it, we are saying we are receiving the cup of blessing. We are receiving what Jesus did for us on the cross. By his blood, we are cleansed. By his stripes, we are healed. By his cross, we are redeemed from the curse and the blessing is on us. By his cross, Satan lies crushed underneath our feet and we walk in victory. By his blood, we are divinely protected. So we receive the full blessings of the cross. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. The Lord Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. The Lord Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant that is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's partake of the cup together, knowing what the blood of Jesus has done for us. Father, I pray that right where people are watching, the power of the cross triumph in their lives. That every sickness and disease, bodily ailments disappear because by his stripes we were healed. Let every oppression of the enemy be dispelled. Let every chain, let every torment of Satan be removed. In the name of Jesus. Because on the cross, Jesus destroyed the one who had the power of death, the devil. Satan, you are disarmed. And I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. I command people to be free from every demonic oppression. I command them to be released in their bodies and minds and in their family situations, in their life situations. I command deliverance by the power of Jesus' name on the basis of the cross. Be delivered. Be free. Father, I thank you for your healing power and virtue flowing through people's bodies and minds, even right now. Thank you, Lord. I just want you to go ahead and receive healing. Whatever need you have in your body, receive healing. Begin to move where you couldn't move. Receive your healing. Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you.
So, Father, we praise you. We thank you for fulfilling your word, for doing what you have declared in your word for each of us today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. You know, if you've joined us uh, during this entire time and, 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 and uh, through the course of this message or during the time of prayer or during the time of partaking in the communion, if the Lord impact, touched your life in, in any way, we'd love to hear from you. The email is on your screen, testimony at apcw.org. Just tell us what God did for you. You know, you received a healing during this time of prayer. Uh, God has worked a deliverance in your life. Uh, or something during this time of, of uh, engagement in the service, God impacted you, touched you. Send an email to us. Tell us what happened. We will rejoice with you. And uh, as we're able, we can share it uh, either on our Facebook page or uh, uh, through a future uh, episode. Uh, share it, uh, our sermon. We can share it with you. Uh, of course, we will not reveal your uh, personal details, but just share what the work of God so that we can all celebrate the goodness of God in our lives. We want to remind you that right after the service, we have our prayer rooms available on Zoom. So if you need personal prayer, our pastoral team is available. You can connect to any one of those, uh, connect to us on Zoom, and you'll be guided into one of the prayer rooms, and somebody will be there to pray and minister to you uh, right after the service. For so those of you who'd like to do that, you're welcome uh, to connect with us from anywhere in the world. Join the Zoom, Zoom room right after prayer, uh, after this time, and uh, we'll be happy to do that. So we're going to close with the benediction. And uh, remember, Jesus Christ loves you. He's your Lord. He's your master. Pursue him with all you've got. Let's close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. God bless you.